Bay West Church meets at 100 Emerson Road in Palm Bay at 11 a.m. on Sundays. We're glad you decided to check us out. God has a specific message of hope for your life and mine today. So listen up. They certainly didn't know how to handle that gas, did they? You know, I, I, I tell you, you know, what in the world are you playing that for, Jim? I'm, I'm telling you. As I was looking through this last week, while I don't really, I'm not a big Zoolander support, all the content in Zoolander, I thought that scene probably has more relevance as to how we handle the topic of anger in our lives than many others that you will ever see. And you go, how in the world is that, Jim? I don't understand how your brain works. That's okay, my wife doesn't either, but I'll show you later. You know, we're in the middle of this series called Outrageous, and what we're doing is trying to learn how to deal with the culture of outrage that's in our lives. I don't know if you guys know it, but it looks like everywhere you look on the news and social media, you can't scroll very long, you can't listen to a news report very long, you certainly can't listen to two people go at it or talking about a subject very long before you realize that there is a real culture of outrage in our, in our country. You know, and we've been talking about how do we navigate that because, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to walk around being angry all the time. I don't want to be contentious with people, but it seems like sometimes that's how that comes about. It, it, it comes about as a, as a part of our lives, and it stays there because it's dangerous. It, it's dangerous, and the Bible talks about this a lot. We've talked about it two weeks ago. We talked about, looked at the story of Cain, and you know how it went with Cain? You know, Cain got mad at his brother. He was mad because he tried to give an offering to the Lord, and he just kind of threw it out there. And <clears throat> regardless of how you, maybe, maybe how you look at that story, Abel gave the best he had. Cain just kind of chunked it out there. And then God was like, I like, I, I like Abel's better because it was the best he had or whatever it was, but made Cain mad. And God asked the first question of Cain that he asked of anybody outside the Garden of Eden. He said, why are you so angry? Why are you so angry, man? And he said, look, sin's crouching at your door. You stay that path, something's going to go wrong. And we know what happened right in the story. Cain stayed mad. It boiled up in him. And one day he asked his brother Abel out into the field and he killed his brother and committed the first murder ever. You know, and what we realized at that point is that anger is a bad driver of our actions. It doesn't need to take control because here's some things that are wrong with anger. Anger asks the wrong questions. It takes you in the wrong direction. And like Cain, it will put you in the wrong destination. Cain's start of that whole scenario was about, I want to be accepted by God. And he got mad when he wasn't. And what it ended up doing is making him less accepted, more rejected. Because what did God do? God said, look, look I'm turning you out from everybody. You're going to go wander aimlessly. You know, and even, but luckily, God was gracious. And God has grace in the middle of that. We saw that. Last week, we talked about the progression of anger. How anger just doesn't just, all of a sudden, you're mad. There's, there's a little, there's, there's, there's a precursor to it. There's like a like the start to a song, you know, that plays really low. I mean, I'm, I, I, always, I always get tricked. Anybody, anybody listen to Van Halen? Any you old people like me? Ever listen to Van Halen? 5150, I know it's Sammy Hagar, but it's okay. It's not real, but, you know, they broke it up. You know, it's David Lee Roth is the real one. But you got Sammy Hagar. There's all this, why can't this be love, this song. And I always turn it, when I turn that on, on my phone, I always go, did I really turn that on? Because if you don't, if you've ever listened to that song, it starts really low. It's like, and, you know, and there's a few, there's a second and a half there. You're like, there's no music coming through my radio. What's going on? You turn it up and all of a sudden it gets really loud and you have to turn it back down because I can't stand that too loud. But anyway, you have this precursor to anger that we talked about last week. And it starts out with hurt feelings and it goes through that progression that we found in Ephesians. And the tough thing about it is anger. What we what we find out is that the anger is there's a danger when it's left unresolved that it brings to your life. It doesn't it doesn't stay as just this anger. If you've been mad with somebody before and you never finished it off, you just got to where you could bear it. And you, you may find out that as you go through life, years past when you've had that angry situation, that a situation similar to what made you mad to begin with will happen. And all of a sudden you're like really mad. And because you didn't realize the anger is still there. And now you're attaching it to this new situation. And that situation might it, you might be saying, why am I getting so mad about this? Why is this making me madder than I should be? And the other thing we realize is anger attaches. It doesn't just attach to one thing and hang around under the surface. What it also does is anger will, um, anger will, will just invade other things in your life. You know, when you're dealing with a lot of anger and you haven't resolved that, you know, what you'll find out is you'll be angry at other people about stupid stuff. And, you'll, and you may even ask yourself, we talked about that story of Laura Coombs last week, who's uh, an author. You know, talked about being later in her life. I mean, her father was murdered. 
And then years later, she's just experiencing all these physical problems. And she, she noticed that she, she came to Christ and those started to get better. But there was still this lingering irritability that hung around in her life. And she was snapping at her kids. She's snapping at her husband. She's getting mad at dumb things. And she said, I even asked myself, why am I angry? This doesn't even make any sense for me to be angry about. And she realized that God revealed her and said, look, you never forgave the man who, who murdered your dad. And I didn't tell you guys all this last week, but she started a relationship. She started writing him, and she wrote, and they corresponded back and forth. And over that time, there was an amazing amount of healing. She has, she has a book out. It's called Letters from My Father's Murderer. And you, and you should read that. You should read that, especially if you're dealing with anger and things, because the, all, the, the uh, antidote to anger is forgiveness. It's forgiveness. You know, when you forgive someone, you're not really letting them out of prison. You're letting yourself out. You know, because the truth is when you hold on to anger, anger is really holding on to you. And that we've got to realize that when we deal with anger, and you can think, man, you just had these two sermons. You anger, anger, this, anger, that. You might think that anger is a bad emotion. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. There's, there's not a lot. Emotions are kind of like warning lights on your dashboard. They signal something's right or wrong. They're not necessarily terrible, bad emotions, but what you do with them, that's where we get into problems a lot of the time. And, and anger can be right. You can be justly angry. You know, you can be outraged about a situation. You can see great injustice, and it can well up inside of you. And you're like, that's just wrong. And that's okay, as long as you do it right. And there's a right way to deal with anger. Anger can be right in your life. The Bible tells us that we can be angry and sin not. And what I'm going to do, I, want, I don't want you to miss next week, because next week, that's what I'm going to be talking about. You know, it's how do you know if your anger is right? How do you know if it's wrong? Because the truth is probably there's people out here right now who are dealing with anger. They're feeling guilty about anger, about anger they have in their heart, about things that should be right, that, that, that's righteous anger. And some people are messing up their whole life because they're really mad about a way that, 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 that's not right anger. And it's screwing up their life. You know, and, and, and it's in ways that you may not even be able to detect. So, look, come next week. Next week's going to be great as well. It's going to help you know if somebody's mad at you, if that's right or not. Because a lot of times somebody gets mad at me, and I'm going, oh, I feel so terrible. You know, because they're mad at me. And because you think, if somebody's mad at you, something must be wrong. Well, it's obviously me. You know, that's where I start with. Am I an idiot? You know, and you start looking at that. And you can stress out and deal with that and churn it in, inside of you. But you need to be able to understand when anger's right and when it's not. Okay, we're going to talk about that next week. But this week, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, how, how we should handle the emotion of anger. Now, in the opening video, <laughs> it's obviously the guys didn't have a good understanding of how to handle something combustible like gas. You know, I mean, you and I, I mean, how many people that, two things, I'm going to ask two questions. In that movie, how many people made a duck face? At least one time or tried to. Okay, all right. How many people, when you started seeing the gas flying around, you thought, oh no, this is going to go bad? That had to do it. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. So you knew, you knew something wasn't going to go right there. And the truth is, that is very similar to how we handle anger in our lives. We don't prepare for it, we don't get ready for it. We're just bebopping along, doing our thing. Something makes us mad, and boom, explosion happens. And relationships damaged. Or we said something to our boss that we shouldn't have said, and all of a sudden now we don't work there anymore. And there's financial problems. Or we said something to our spouse. All of a sudden, we thought everything was fine. Have you ever been fine, and you just said something, and all of a sudden your spouse went, oh, and, and you're like, what did that come from? And you don't know what to deal with it. And maybe instead of dealing with it right there, you just right back at them. And before you knew it, you've got this little bitty thing, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a family member, whether it's a friendship, whether it's a neighbor. The dog pooped on your lawn one time too many, and you just blew up on them, and they were like, I didn't realize you were mad. You know, just don't step in it, you know, and like, it shouldn't be there. And you get into this big thing. And before you know it, you've got a thing, and there's explosion, and there's damage, and there's consequences that aren't easily fixed. I think we've all been there at one time or another. So I'm going to teach you this morning from God's Word about how to deal with anger. What we're going to do is a James, Jesus' brother, wrote about anger in the New Testament. It's in a book called James. See? Boom. The Bible's not that hard to understand. James and James wrote it. You know, but he talks about anger in just a few verses. That, and there's so much. I love, I love the Bible. The Bible is really great because it's such a master wordsmith. 
I mean, God worked through, you know, all these writers over 3,000 years to write this and keep a consistent theme. If that can't tell you that there's a God, I don't know what can. Because you had generals and you had, you had farmers and you had royalty smart people and you had people like me who are not very smart. And God used them. You know, to just spout off this stuff. And it's consistent in theme and it shapes who God is all throughout Scripture. And James, Jesus' half-brother, who was a leader in the early church, he wrote in his book of James about anger. Now, if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn to James uh, chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verse 19 through 21. If you've got your smart device, hey, it's totally cool. Nobody's going to give you the stink eye for pulling it out. Pull it out, look at it, open up your Brown Bible app. If you've got your Brown Bible app and you, your you version Bible, you can type in Bay West under events and you'll find our notes. If you like, I don't want to deal with typing yet, Jim, you can go to our Facebook page. Click on a link right there that takes you right to my notes. Or you can open up your Bible and your notebook and go old school, and that's totally cool because old school is always cool. That's what I'm going to be going with now that I am old school. Most all of my stuff is old school. So anyway, we're in James. And if you don't have any of that stuff or you don't want to deal with it, be right up here. And you can read along with us. In James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. In verse 21, it continues. It says, So get rid of all the filth. And evil in your lives, and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. The first thing I want you to see is back in verse 19, is that James gives us three very distinct things that we need to be adept with when we're managing anger. They need to be in the part of our lives. One of the first things that he says is everyone should be quick to listen. I don't know about you, but when I get angry, I think everybody needs to hear my opinion. I don't really am not into listening to what everyone else has to say. And the truth is, is that's, that's, that's sinful nature right there. You know, I need to understand the situation with anger. And a lot of times what, what we do in our own nature, what our natural instinct is, is very different from what God is telling us to do. That's another signifier that you need Christ in your life. Is because the things that are healthy, when you get down to them, to do are not your natural bent instinct to do. And a lot of times you end up following those instincts, those sinful natures, which sinful, you know, we call that as an insult. But really all that means is you're doing it different from what God said. Okay, that's all sinful is. Okay, really? So you decide to do it your way instead of God's way and you make a mess. You know, and I do it. I do it all the time. I try my best not to. Sometimes it's just Jim's just going to be determined to go run his face right into a wall. I don't know if you guys are like that, but I am. So, I mean, the first thing he says, though, is that we should be quick to listen. You know, long ago, a friend of mine shared with me uh, an article that he read, and he talked about in the absence of information in a quarrel, or in, absence of or in the absence of information in general, most humans will assume the worst case or scenario or a bad case and, and take that to be fact and act on it. Do you ever do that? When you don't know, do you really live by no news is good news? Or do you realize is no news is there's about to be a nuclear war and I better prep? Is that how you live? I mean, sometimes I'm like, oh, well, I don't hear from them. Oh, no. I mean, we can see this in our lives. But the truth is when we're dealing in, it's our nature to try to avoid trouble. And when we're dealing with anger, when we know there's no information or we have a lack of it, we think, okay, I better figure out how I'm going to survive what's coming around the corner. You know, that's why we're afraid of the dark. We can't see what's down there. So obviously, what do we think? Oh, it must be a monster under the bed. You know, that's what's up. Every sound is somebody coming to get me. It's Jason or Freddy or whoever, Godzilla. I don't know. We tend to, that'd be a lot bigger than a little one. But anyway, you know what I'm saying. We tend to look that way. And, and, and it, when we deal with anger in the lack of information, if we go that way, if we, we start to just, I'm just going to, I don't, I don't care what anybody else says or thinks. I don't want to know. I'm just going to, I know what's up and you're that way. Which it's, it's like dealing with air can be like shaking up nitroglycerin, you know, or playing tennis with like a ball fashioned out of a C4 explosive or something like that. It's, it's not good. It doesn't end up well. So what you need to listen to, you need to be quick to listen. There's three sources of information you really need to be quick to listen to, okay, to get the proper perspective. The first thing you listen, need to listen to is to others. To the person you're in conflict with. You know, what is the truth? What really is? You know, what, not what someone else figures or your best guess, but get accurate info 
about what's going on. So many times people have said, have you, have you ever had this? They said, oh, well, did you hear what they said about you? They said this, 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 and this. And you realize that, you're, it, it, that it's not exactly what they said, but the way the person phrased it or the, the, the tone of their voice when they shared that with you, it made you feel like, oh, that's the worst thing in the world. And you go back to that person. You go, hey, did you say this? And they quote you what they said with their tone and stuff, and it hadn't got run through a bunch of filters of other people, and it's not nearly as bad as what you thought it was. Maybe it's not even bad at all. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's a different way they phrased it. I means something totally different than the person who heard it as they took it. You know, and they leave it for you, and, and, but you didn't have accurate information. You need to listen to them. What, ask this. Is there a deeper truth in what they say? You know, it, maybe, maybe when they, what they mean, what they really mean, maybe they did say it. Maybe that's how they said it. But what they really mean is deeper than just the words themselves. For example, maybe they're not acting out of maybe they're they're reacting out of fear and not malice. You know, maybe I need to help assuage their fear more than I need to blast them off the planet. You know, for firing their laser beams at me. Maybe that's what I need to do. But you have to listen to others and take care of get accurate information on the situation. Second thing you need to listen to is to yourself. And this is something we need to. Do. God asked Cain first question: Why are you so angry? Every one of us should have that question in our vocabulary when we start to get angry. We should ask ourselves, why is this bothering me? It's not enough that it does. Why? What is this really doing? Because that person said something to me. I'm, I'm, I've heard people say this before. Well, they said something about you. Does that make it true? No, but it still bugs me. Why does it bug me? Am I insecure about that? Maybe there's some truth in what they say. Do I need to be worried about that? You, it's important to ask yourself, why am I so angry? Why is this bothering me? Is, is there something in my past? Here's the other thing like we talked about earlier. Is there something in my past that's causing me to overreact to this situation? Is there anger back in my past that I never resolved and it looks like this situation? It looks like, smells like, almost sounds like this situation. And so I am taking all the anger that's been welled up and stored in my little safe in the back. And now that I'm dealing with something that looks like it, I'm going to just explode all of that over them. I'm going to think of all the things that I would have said to that person back there or that I should have said to that person when they did that. And I didn't think about it. I wasn't cool enough to come up with a real good quip. And it's just been hanging around in the back of my mind. Now I'm going to, you know, I'm just throw it at them. I'll throw my little verbal jags, verbal daggers out on them. I'm going to just take them out. You know, I'm going to go Edward Scissorhands all over them. You know, that's what I'm going to do. Maybe you do that. Maybe that's what you're going to do. And you just carve them up and make them a whole new thing. You know, I don't know. But think about, your, think about it. What, is it something in your past, something in your past that's just hanging around there? Just hanging around there. What happens to most of us a lot of times is, is our situation will, will, with someone will appear to be one way. It's usually negative. And we'll begin to extrapolate. Or what that means is build upon. Build concrete conclusions on what we think might happen or what we think they really mean. You know, we've got to be careful with those types of things. You know, in our insecurity, we think that because someone doesn't speak to us, it's because they hate us or they don't like us or they snubbed us. When really, they're just thinking about popcorn later and they weren't thinking about it. I mean, it happens to me all the time. I'm going to tell you right now. If there's been a time, I'm just going to be honest. Okay, let's be sure. You, there's probably been a time I almost fell off stage. Okay, there's <laughs> Facebook. You're going to know this too. All right, looking forward. There will be a time that you walk past me probably on a Sunday morning, and you go, hey, Jim, and I go, how, and I keep going. It's not because I don't like you. It's not because I don't love you. It's because I've got a one-track mind, and I can handle one thing at a time. And there was something in there, and it was right there. And if I stop to say, it just goes. And you know when I figure it out? In the middle of the service, when I was supposed to have done it, and I didn't. And all of a sudden, everything comes crashing down. That's when I remember, you know, oh, I was going to do that. But it didn't. And it, I'm just trying to get stuff done, man. And I'm going to tell you what. Just, just full disclosure, man, I have, I have got an email and a phone number and an office and all this stuff. Call me during the week. Please do not. Please don't grab me five minutes before the sermon. Go, Jim, I want, I want to talk to you about this deep theological issue. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I love you in Jesus' name, but my eyes are going to be looking at you. But I'm going to be thinking, okay, I've got to get on this, sir. I've got, okay, this countdown is at three minutes. 
Okay, what do I have to do? I got to turn on my mic. Okay, is my mic on? Is it right here? Okay, is my kids? Where are my kids at? Are they over here? Okay, so, uh-oh, somebody just fell off a chair. Okay, what do I need to do with that? Okay, I have to fix the chair. I need to do this right here. You know, the, the light's not right. I got to go fix that. And, 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 and it's nothing, but I mean, that's, that's, that's what's going on as you see. It's like a, like a, it's like a little uh, fuse that's just and disintegrating, you know. And, I mean, it's what's going on in my brain. You know, and, and so, so, but that's, but that's, that's how it is because you get, you get in yourself. You, if you're not careful in your insecurity, when someone doesn't speak to us, we can think, oh, they purposely are ignoring us. They don't like us. We think that because a friend turned us down to hang out four times that they're avoiding us or there's some terrible secret that you don't know. Okay. They think I'm crazy. No, they don't. They were just busy. It's okay. Sometimes you may be right. And the one, one time you may be right. And it's the worst case that you've ever thought. And that one time will just, just wipe away all the thousands of times that you were overreacting. Those don't matter. That 999 times don't matter. There was one time 15 years ago that it was like that. So I'm going to react in that way. Y'all stop it. Just don't do that. <laughs> so do that. As you know, I've got a mirror in the back. I look into it every time I preach, and I go, okay. I'm telling myself the same thing. Jim, stop it. It's not really in the back. It's kind of in my head, but you know what I mean. I'm doing the same thing because I have to stop it because I will do that. My wife will tell you. I'll stay up night, and I'll just be playing out scenarios in my head. She's like, go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep. Stop it. Turn on the TV. Put on the headphones. Pretend you're not here. I mean, just stop. Just do something. Okay. That's how you'll do. Stop it. Don't do that. Get accurate information about yourself. Why does it bother you? Be honest with yourself. And don't get, don't get like too uppity about it. Well, I am mad with somebody way back then, but I'm not going to admit it because I'm too proud. That's stupid. Okay? Pride's stupid. All right? Pride gets you hurt. Pride messes you up. Pride screws up your future. Quit it. All right? Just stop it. If you messed up, hey, great. We're all sinners. That's a fact. It's not an insult. We blew it, okay? Ask forgiveness of God. Repent. I'm not going to do that again. Lord, I'll do what you ever you have me to do to fix that, but we're just going to move on, and I'm going to let that stuff go and move forward. Listen to others. Listen to yourself. Most of all, listen to God. What, what does the Bible say about the issue you're dealing with? What does the Bible say? A lot of times there are clear directives a lot of times I'm reading through the word and I'm like, okay, wow, that sounds just like what I'm going through right now. And by the end of the story, it'll be somebody just doing something really stupid, which is probably what I was about to do. And there's something, or there's somebody doing something really right. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to try that and see if it's okay. Not only that, but as you look at the, at the Bible and you read through the Bible, there's not all the time that the Bible's going to be talking about an iPhone and getting a ticket and Stuff like that, you know, or dealing with a boss, you know, who shorted you hours or didn't get your bonus in or whatever like that. That may not be there, but the Holy Spirit, because you're a Christ follower, comes along and he kind of massages what you're reading and saying, aha, see how that sounds like something? What is the Holy Spirit telling you to do? Are you spending time in prayer? God, what do I need to do about this? And then do you shut up and listen and not concentrate on anything else? Or you say, God, what do I need to do about this? And you go watch Daredevil on Netflix. I don't know, for the 15th time. Is that what you do? Because if you ask God, what do you want me to do? A good thing is, is to shut your mouth in and listen. Or read in his word and let him talk to you. That's a good thing to do. Other thing is, is what do people in my life who are mature spiritually tell me about the situation? You always need to have people in your life that you know follow Jesus. That you, you see it in their lives. And you say, you know what? I, that's a person I need to go talk to and just kind of lay this out in front of. Sometimes the Lord said, this is really in conflict. I'll be right on. Matthew 18, let me give you a real quick one. Matthew 18, if somebody comes and talks to me, well, I'm mad at this person over here. The first thing I'm going to ask you is, have you talked to that person over there? And if you haven't talked to them, I'm going to say, well, sorry, I'm not going to talk to you. Because Matthew 18 tells me the first thing you need to do is you go talk to them alone. Don't tell a bunch of people. Go talk to them. Try to work it out. Win your brother back. 99% of conflict gets fixed right there. You know, you need somebody who is mature in your life. And, and, and not just people that will just listen to you. Blah. You need people that will listen, but will also give you back spiritual, honest, mature truth. And you need to have that in your life at all times. The second thing we need to be doing is not just quick to listen, but it says slow to speak. I mean, and in this one, this is where I fail most of the time, really. You know, Proverbs 29, 20 says, Do you see someone who speaks in haste? 
You see someone who speaks in haste, there's more hope for a fool than for them. That's sad. I read that, I get all convicted. You know, I'm like, I, gotta, I, I, I pride myself sometimes to be able to, to think on my feet and, and speak quickly. And then I read verses like this. I said, look, you need to slow down, brother. Don't just run off at the mouth. In this case, haste really does make waste, probably more than any situation. Here are, some, here are three evaluation questions that you need to make before you speak, okay? All right? Before you speak. Three evaluation questions. One, will these words honor God? Will these words honor God? You know, it, it, uh, Psalm 19.4 says that our prayer needs to be let, Lord, may the words of my mouth please you. Well, what I'm about to say, will it honor the Lord? Second thing, will it make the situation better or improve things in the future? A lot of times we, you know, we can't answer yes to the first, but we think it's going to make it better right now. I'm going to blow up all this person, and our better is I feel better for a moment. And then you realize what you said and how you said it, and you look like a big dummy, and then later on they don't talk to you anymore. you got to think about the future when you're doing this stuff. What am I about to say? Will it honor the Lord? Will it honor God? Will it make things, the situation better, or will it improve things in the future? Another thing is, will this help people understand the gospel? Everything you do should it really, to be quite honest, those are good questions to ask. Not just when you're mad. But when you're mad, they're imperative because you're handling explosives. And you need to take care of that. One thing, our, our mission is to be making disciples here and everywhere for the glory of God. We should always act in concert with that mission. We should speak in concert with that mission. Will my words demonstrate Christ's love? Will they be a testament to God's justice? Will they paint to that person the actu- act- an accurate picture of who God is? Not just make me feel better because I can give them a come to Jesus talk. You know, come to Jesus talk doesn't really have the discipleship connotation on it, you know? Okay? It's not, I'm going to give you come to Jesus. Very rarely do I see people go, yes, I need to come to Jesus. After the end of that, usually they're really mad because we, we go off on them. Don't do that. You know, Proverbs, 20, Proverbs 14, 17 says, tells us that a quick-tempered man acts foolishly. Well, later in Proverbs 14, Solomon tells us that the man who is slow to get angry, slow to get angry, demonstrates or has understanding. You know, the truth is, is the third thing is, is we need to be slow to get angry. Third thing is slow to get angry. You know, Proverbs 29, 11 tells us that the fool gives full vent to his anger, but the wise man holds it back. Because anger, like anything in life, if you don't know this, anger, like anything in life, needs an element of control to it. You know, imagine yourself carrying a volatile explosive when you're dealing with anger. That's what you need to be like. You're on the bomb squad. That's what, when you're dealing with anger, you need to think about that. I got the pads on me. You know, I'm being very careful. I'm not making a lot of noise. I'm really listening to everything that's going on around me. You know, I'm going to be really slow in my movements. It's really good if you're acting, if you're mad and stuff like that. Think of yourself in slow motion. At this moment, I need to be in slow motion. I'm going to think very carefully about what I'm about to react to in this situation. Slow motion is good. With that, only quick to listen is the thing that you need to do. But you think about it. Imagine yourself carrying a volatile, volatile explosive. You, 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 know, you have studied and you've gathered all the information and you've listened well. You're focused and careful about your movements and your next course of action because nobody wants to pull the red wire, right? If you're defusing a bomb, right? Or is it the white wire? I don't know. You figure it out. It's different in every movie. But anyway, you progress through the stages slowly. You take care that you do everything right because you know your actions count. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, man, I wish I'd gotten angry faster. God, if I'd just blown it a little bit quicker, man, it would have been cooler. 100% of the time, it's always the other way. Gosh, I wish I'd slowed down. I wish I hadn't said that. I wish I hadn't thought that. It's getting now in my older age. I'm getting a little control on stuff that comes out every now and then, you know, and so now I just internalize it and then I deal with all this. And it's like I'm like the Hulk when he eats a bomb, it blows off inside, you know, and, and some people outside, they may not know it unless they look at my face, which is the digital screen. But on the inside, then you got all this damage you got to deal with inside. It's not just internalizing anger, that doesn't fix it either. But then James tells us, some, tells us the reason for all of this in verse 20. He says, Look, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. God's not looking for that in your life. 
It's not going to produce what you want it to produce. The truth is because anger is so powerful and volatile, it's hard to handle it right. In fact, the, the only being that can handle anger perfectly is God himself. And he is angry. But he's always, 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 always perfect in the measure of his anger. Always. I'll be honest with you, I don't think I have ever handled anger when I have allowed it to come out at the perfect measure. I have either gone too far or not far enough. I've shot over, outside, around. I've turned around, shot myself in the target. You know, I don't know. I have never handled it well. I don't think anyone handles it perfectly except God. I know that to be true. That's why we have to be careful with it. And see, then James gives us a couple more things to consider in handling anger when we get to the end. First thing he says in verse 21 is, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. And so we often think that we can follow God with most of our lives, but we'll hold back this one little part that we can kind of do what we want to with, right? Doesn't really matter. I'm doing a lot of this stuff for God. I'm like a 70% Christ follower. You know, 30 to me, you know, God's all about the tithing thing. What if I gave him 10% of my life? I hold back 90 and do whatever I want to with it. You know, I mean, that, that type of stuff. Sometimes we act that way, but that's a fool's game because you can't keep it separate. You know, when you place things in your life that are contrary to God and your personal habits and your practices, your thoughts, your passions, they erode or they seep into other parts of your lives. Because anger attaches and it moves across boundaries. You know, the word there when it says get rid of all the anger, it actually is more literal translation would be to put off or to take off. Kind of like clothes. I think in Hebrews 12, it's actually translated as strip off, you know. But it's saying, you strip off the, all this junk that's on you. Think about the, the moral filth and evil in your life as clothes. Your clothing touches your whole body. You know, it restricts your movement. If you wear a shirt that's just not right, it restricts your movement. It may cause you to walk different. You just don't know. It messes with things, and it touches and affects all. It restricts movement. It adds weight. Some clothes are better for playing sports than others when you think about it. You know, it can hide certain aspects of your body. You don't want a big shirt because you don't want to see you got a big fat roll. You know, I don't want to do that. And you hide that. Here's the problem. When you hide things in your life from God, you hide it from God being able to affect it and to change what's going on in your heart and your life. You hide it from other people. Your brothers and sisters can't see it. They don't see what's going on. They can't speak into your life because you're hiding it. It's back over here in the corner. But it needs to be spoken to because it's causing dangerous and it's causing uh, damage in places. Imagine the filth and evil like the gasoline in the video. A lot of times we just, I'm just having fun. I'm just slinging it over myself. It's all right. It just smells funny. It's no big deal. It's all cool. We're having a good time. The moral filth and evil, but it is dousing the clothes that we have. And then all of a sudden, the spark of anger is introduced, which in itself really shouldn't be that big of a deal. But the spark of anger is introduced and explosions happen. A lot of times, James goes on, he says, so get rid of the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God, the word God has planted in your hearts For it has the power to save your soul. So first it says take all the moral filth and evil out of the world. Take that off. All your past habits. You know. All the all the all the old patterns that you thought used to work before you knew Jesus that really didn't, but you really were sure that it did. You know, all the all the apps that used to work on your old operating system before Christ refreshed you and gave you a new operating system and those don't work anymore. That they highly conflict it. Get rid of all that stuff. Put on the right lab coat for the job. And humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. And when you talk about humbly accept, you've got to think about that. Don't miss the humbly part of that. Not only do I accept God's word, but I, I humbly accept it. You know, humility, being humble, is not thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less. And I want to add this onto it. It's thinking of yourself less and trusting God more. So rather than my, when God tells me to do something, my response shouldn't be, oh, here, let me extrapolate all the bad things that will happen with that. I need to shut up, stop worrying about what's going to happen to me. I worry how, I ha- how God looks when I react, and I need to react in a way that honors the Lord and do that 
and think of my consequences less and trust him more for the future. And the truth is this word, it says it's planted in your hearts. I love that. It's a symbol of growth. When you plant a seed, is it a full mature tree immediately? No. It takes some time for it to get a big tree. It takes a while. Do you know what that means for you? Is it, mean, it, it means that you have to understand that what is inside you is not fully mature yet. You can trust God's word, but your understanding of it is not there. And it's all right. That means that sometimes you won't understand what God's asking you to do. Sometimes the results won't make any sense to you. But like I tell my kids about obedience, evaluation and quality control is not your job. It's not my job. I don't, I don't obey God. And then when he, things happen and I know in my heart that I follow God and I look at what's happened after that, I don't get to go back over here and go, uh-huh, okay, didn't meet my expectations. It wasn't what I thought, blah, 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 blah. God, that's about a D. You need to shape it up and do a little bit better. And that's stupid, but I'm going to tell you right now, I will do that. If I'm not careful. And I venture to say, a lot of us out there will. We've trusted God for something. We really trusted. I'm trusting you, God. I'm putting my heart in you. I'm putting my faith in you. I'm on, and I know how this is going to end. I'm putting my faith. And a lot of times we put our faith not in God and his definition of when. We're putting our faith in God to put together the circumstances that we feel in our hearts should be a win. That we've figured out. That's what the wind's going to be. So obviously God agrees with me. So that's what's going to happen. And I know the future. The truth is you don't know the future. God is the only one that knows the future. But you can trust in a faithful God that says, I have your best interest in heart. I will take care of you. I will, make your, I will meet your needs through your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Memory verse. One-on-one with God, guys. Got that? Uh-huh. You can trust in those things. You can't know the future, but you can know God. And that's why God says, I want you to know me deeply. I want you to know me intimately. That's why I want you to trust me. Because I will help you handle the things in your life. You just do it. And you leave the results to God. Why do you do that? Because that word, it has the power to save your soul. We sang about that in a song earlier. Save my soul. Boy, that's all churchy. My soul. You know what my soul is? My soul is everything that I am. And will be from here on out. And God says, I will preserve that. The word I've put in you will preserve that. I will preserve you. That is why we humbly accept the word that God has put in, in our life. Because the power of Christ can diffuse any explosion in your life. We have a lot of them, and they're not just to do with anger. Now, you may not be a Christ follower today, and you've heard a lot of what I said, and I'm going to tell you the, 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 the questions that I put up. Um, those are good things to have. Those are good things for you to use. But I'm going to tell you, you're not going to see the greatest benefit of that until you begin to trust Christ with your life. Because the biggest command in all of that is to humbly accept the word that God has planted in your heart. And you haven't even accepted Christ yet for him to plant the word in your heart to begin with. You realize? And maybe you haven't followed Christ to this point. And today, you're starting to realize, okay, man, I've got this anger in my heart. I, 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 I am snapping at people. And, what? I, and maybe God is even, even where you are. Even not following him, you have, he has allowed your brain to remember, hey, there's something back there I should, I should deal with. And you're like, I don't even know where to start to deal with it. The first thing you need to do is to commit your life to follow Christ from here on out the rest of the way. And say, God, I realize I'm a sinner. I've screwed it up somewhere. I don't know anybody that hadn't screwed up something. But we realize that the law of God says one screw up, that's it. And I couldn't even make it to consciousness of my actions before I had already figured out how to disobey my parents, how to do things that shouldn't be done. Even as a little bitty kid, as a two, three-year-old, as a toddler. Toddlers, yeah, if you can't see sin nature, you haven't looked at your toddler very good lately. And that's all of us, man. 
It's not an insult. It's a fact. We have all chosen our own way. We, have, we were born with a sin nature, and then we chose to act on that nature. And we have walked away from God. We are all sinners. We have no hope for the future. There's no karma that I can do to get back from my past. I can't fix my past. I can only trust God in the presence and hope in God for the future. And that's all I have. And that's all anybody has. And if you can look at your past and you don't trust God for the present and you have no hope for the future, that's a sad place to be. I don't want you to be there. You don't have to be there. That's not what God had for you. So if you trust that, hey, I've screwed up. I get it, God. We're different. I want to try. I trust in Jesus. He sent Jesus to come to earth. Jesus lived a perfect life here. He never sinned, yet he died on a cross because death is required for my sin, separation from God, death here, everything. All that's required for my sin. But Jesus, he came and he lived a perfect life. And he died on a cross for you and for me. And he gave us this mandate. He said, look, if you will trust in me with all your heart, and you will believe that I was, I'm God's son, that I came, I was raised from the dead. If you believe in your heart, you confess that with your mouth, and you trust me, that believe in your heart means I will trust you for my actions and decisions from here to the end of my days. And if I'm going to go down on some ship, it's going to be going down on making your decisions, Jesus. It's not going to be making mine. If that's your intention to trust that, if you haven't followed Christ to this point, you make that decision today, and that's very simple. Very simple on how you do that. I'm going to ask everyone to, 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 close, to close their eyes, bow their head, and I want you to be praying at this one. That's just to keep your space, no distractions, keep distractions to a minimum right here. But here's what I want you to say. If that's your tension in your heart, I'm going to follow Christ, and that's your first time doing that today. Here's what you say. God, I am tired of screwing it up, doing it my way. I want your perfect good life that you have coming from me. And Lord, I trust you for that definition. I am a sinner. I realize that Jesus is your son. He came, he died on earth, he lived perfect, and he died for my sins, and I want to give my life to him, believing that so strongly that I will trust you for the rest of my life. And then when you do that, that's not magic about the words, it's the intention of your heart, and on the holy blood, on, on, the, on the gracious blood of Jesus, it's not my any work that you've done, there's no magical incantation that makes you a Christian. God comes in and saves you. And that word, the word of God, Jesus, can save your soul. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, right here. And at that moment, when you express that to God and you trust him as he's called you and you trust him, you need to say, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Because at that moment, it's been done. And from here, God just wants you to walk with him and find out all the things that he has created this awesome life for you. It's like opening a door. It says, you couldn't see all this cool stuff I had. Now, great, you're coming over. Great, let me open this. And let me show you all these things that I have for you. That's what we have to be. That's what we have to be about. That's what we have to give our lives to Christ. Maybe you are a Christ follower, and you've recognized some problems with anger in your life, or you've recognized I'm snappy, I'm snippy, or I'm snippy about this certain thing all the time, and you realize you need to go back and you need to use the antidote for anger and truly forgive. I'm going to tell you, you don't have to be good enough to do that. God's power can do it through the word that you humbly accept in your heart. And you need to remove some moral filth from your life. You need to remove some evil from your stuff. You need to stop throwing marbles out in front of you before you walk through a room and slip up. You need to get rid of that junk. And you need to trust the word that God has put in your heart and see what he can do for you this week. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've done. I thank you that you love us and you care for us. I thank you for your power. I thank you, Lord, that it's not dependent on me. It's not my actions. There's nothing I can boast about in coming to know you, Lord. I don't have to be good enough. I just have to be, be humble enough to say, please, will you fix me? Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Thanks for being a part of Bay West today. Bay West Church meets at 100 Emerson Road in Palm Bay at 11 a.m. on Sundays. Please feel free to check us out at baywestchurch.org or you can follow us on Facebook at Bay West Church.